So, um, yes, I'll just quickly sort of cover why I submitted an abstract for the session um, and also sort of thinking about the conference theme of making a difference and um, the value of archaeology. Um, and, and I think on that, um, about extending to thinking about the value of heritage and um, the historic built environment, which is primarily my focus. Um, and I spend a lot of my time uh, in between writing heritage statements and other reports um, of promoting the value of archaeology um, to complementary sectors, um, including the real estate sector. Um, and, and that's not always easy, um, and more on that later. But um, what I experience sometimes is that it's not a collaborative working environment. Sometimes it's very adversarial. Um, and, you know, it, it got me thinking about... Um, the session summary as well and, and sort of that uh, you know thinking about mine and others experiences of trying to affect sympathetic um, and sustainable change to the historic um, built environment so um, in terms of the session summary it was the last part of the last sentence that says change is risky but what is more stultifying or just plain boring than continuing to do what we've always done um, my immediate response was that we have to change, um, and there are very serious implications, I think, specifically for the historic built environment, um, of not um, you know, changing and taking a bit more of a, of, of a risk. Um, and, and I think this is um, especially the case in a landscape of reduced funding and reduced funding from government agencies as well. We have to understand who are the people who are interacting with the built environment, who are willing to take a risk, you know, uh, but there has to be a viability element to that as well at the same time. So um, I think you know, the status quo isn't good enough. Um, and conversely, I think you know, there are a multitude of benefits um, to the historic and built environment, um, which are social and economic, and I'm going to provide some examples of that. Um, and I think we need to think a bit differently. I think we need to be more flexible, um, innovative, uh, more commercially minded. Um, in our approach, um, and I think you know heritage will benefit from that. Um, obviously, being mindful of our ethical obligations as well. So um, it's all about balance, getting the right balance here. So um, in terms of sort of the, the the referencing the session title of pushing the boundaries, what I'm saying is I'm not um, advocating for pushing up against our established standards and guidance, ethical code, or planning policy essentially, but I want people to be more mindful of them and introduce, understand that it can help um, introduce consistency in how we approach change to the historic built environment. Um, quite a lot of the criticism that's levelled at um, heritage is that it's uh, very subjective in terms of interpretation of what we've got in place and guidance, planning policy. Um, and, and, and that's, that's an issue. Um, there's no sort of yardstick when there is, but we just need to sort of reference it a bit more is my, my thought. Um, so also then the second half of that is about pushing the boundaries of established use and traditional uses of buildings and thinking about how to use them in a different way. Um, I recently read in the Institute of Historic Building Conservation's magazine context where on a high street empty units is now being used for axe throwing. So um, yeah, some people might like that, some may not, but the building's being used. I'm not saying that's a good thing for me. Personally, I'd rather another use, but it's being used. So um, just thinking about sort of experience and examples um, of where thinking differently has brought about uh, social and economic impact, thereby creating value. We've got good out outcomes, but also of not thinking differently where we have negative outcomes. Um, heritage is devalued uh, financially and conceptually. Um, sometimes by not doing things differently, we disincentivize people to engage with heritage. Um, and, you know, practitioners can make it difficult um, for individuals, developers, to do things, good things with buildings. Um, and, and, you know, this has far-reaching consequences, I think. You know, it's, uh, we've got practitioners, decision makers, spending their time, they're under pressure, they're under-resourced in local authorities. They're spending their time looking at paint swatches rather than, you know, what's going on down the road where someone wants to do a terrible thing to a building. You know, it's, it's all about priorities. Um, and I could go on for some time on those, but that's not really what I'm looking at here. So um, part of my work is trying to get people to think about heritage at the front end of development as well. We have value. We add value. Oftentimes we come in when 
it becomes a challenge. And actually, it didn't start out being a challenge. It's just because it's not been thought about at the beginning. So that's part of my, my role, I, I think. Um, as I said, I spend a lot of time advocating for the historic built environment. Um, I do sessions on, so um, this is a couple of years ago, Real Estate Women, where um, I, I facilitated a heritage and real estate uh, webinar. So the audience were developers, pension funds, investment banks. It was very well attended. Um, the picture is Stockport, which um, has done fantastic things with using historic buildings as a catalyst for town centre regeneration. It's fantastic. They're introducing uh, residential, um, social housing into the city centre. And um, the marketplace has now become quite a vibrant focus for, uh, they've introduced a nightlife economy where there wasn't one before. Absolutely fantastic. So um, I have to own up, I did cross over to the dark side after doing my degree. I ended up as an analyst in an investment bank. But, you know, transferable skills, that's the benefit of an archaeology degree. We become good analysts. So, um, you know, real estate sector, I focused on, on that. So it is an area where I think it's complementary to what we do. Um, there are funds to do things with historic buildings, so it's an area that I do advocacy within. Um, I'm constantly trying to alter perceptions um, that uh, heritage is a challenge. Um, so, you know, it's, it, I, I love words. Um, so I've discovered that I am a logophile, uh, which is one for the next pub quiz or crossword. Um, and well, this always happens, sorry. Okay. So, um, yes. So, you know, thinking about the definition of challenge, and this is the thing, this is a word that comes up quite a lot of times. Um, and I can relate to this. It's an invitation to comp compete in a fight. Uh, and um, it's very interesting when I go to these events, um, going beyond the sort of quizzical expression and facial expressions of, okay, you're a woman in a sea of men all dressed in navy suits and wearing gilets, which is the uniform of the real estate sector, it's rather amusing, um, to, um, oh, you're a heritage consultant. And then there's this realisation, oh, you're a heritage, oh, right, okay. And then you just get this barrage of people just going, oh, I really need to speak to you last week or something. So, um, <laughs> it, it, it is a sort of generally a, a sort of a sharing of horror stories, which is a bit depressing. But the thing is, they've engaged with it. This is, it I'm quite amazed by the amount of people who um, are willing to take that risk. They have made an investment, they're doing something with it, and they, they need a viable end use, but have come up against um, uh, you know, issues. So, um, and the thing is, talking to them, they are put off. That's it. They probably won't want to do this again. Um, and, and this really, you know, it, it, it concerns me. Um, sometimes you'll always have the stereotypical developer. Of, you know, I'm not an apologist for, for these. There are people who want to do terrible things to buildings. That, you can't stop that. I'm not willing to help them. That's fine. But there's a lot of people who want to do good things with buildings. Um, and, you know, it, it fundamentally, I do what I do because I value heritage and, you know, code, code of conduct and specifically the ethical obligation of being responsible for the conservation of the historic environment. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, I think, is a common goal. It should be a common goal. That's what we're trying to do. So, um, you know, it, but we're faced with uh, practitioners, decision makers who want to conserve these things in aspect. Um, and I don't think that's in the best interests of conservation sometimes, but more on that later. Um, so back to horror stories um, and the challenge and uh, the fight. So this is <laughs> Fight Club. I've, I'm aware that the first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk about it. So that's gone out of the window. They do talk about it. Uh, second rule supposedly is don't talk about it, continue. The other third rule of Fight Club I have discovered was um, if someone yells stop, they go limp, tap out and the fight is over. Um, and I think that's what really concerns me because uh, having these good conversations with people, they want to give up, that's it. They don't want to engage any further. So, um, you know, at the high level, um, we, the criticism is that, you know, it's going through listed building consent, it's bureaucratic, it's time consuming. Um, and a letter that's sent recently to the Architects Journal, a uh, director of an architectural consultancy, he, he wants to get rid of all the red tape. That's it. I don't necessarily agree with that. But, um, you know, it's, it, they, they face inconsistency in interpretation and historic buildings are an issue or perceived issue and a perceived challenge. 
Um, and I think there's a responsibility. We have a, the architecture, real estate is complementary to what we do. Um, and I think we need to understand a bit more where we fit in, how we can work more collaboratively to, you know, with the intent of doing the best thing for, you know, conservation and the historic um, uh, environment. Um, I did mention, you know, it is acknowledged that planning authorities are under-resourced, under-financed, um, under-skilled in some areas where we have young planners who are sent on a HE half-day course and all of a sudden they are the conservation officer. Um, they do design, they don't have any design uh, background. So, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's uh, frustrating for people, I think. Um, the, you know, in cases where proposals are not controversial, um, and, you know, it, it, there's focus in areas that where there shouldn't be. So, um, you know, it, it, it's decisions being made on a subjective basis. And this is the challenge. This is the fight that, that people have who want to engage um, with uh, buildings. Um, planning policy is unhelpful um, in terms of national planning policy, in terms of harm. There's no concept of no harm in planning policy. It's either substantial or less than substantial. So that's already driving people to negativity thinking about harm um, but the positive is there's planning practice guidance where actually you now have to interrogate the level of harm within that and there is a concept that you know something can actually be beneficial within that and um, and I think that's what I'd like to do you know that's where I mean it look at what established guidance we have oftentimes um, I, I have to point decision makers in the direction of that I get a response I don't like it that's not good, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. I, that's, you need to frame this within the guidance. Um, and, and I'm not unusual in, in having that response. Um, so I think it's, you know, the frameworks are there to provide consistency. Obviously there is sort of options for interpretation within that. But um, I think we really need to think differently about how we work within that framework. Um, there's an older Architects Journal article um, that is, you know, it, back from February 2020, where it says retrofit in, you know, is the heritage sector adapting to reuse? So it, you know, flags HE's great work on climate change, and this is a real opportunity. There is now a focus on retrofit, regeneration, high streets. Um, you know, we can get good, innovative uses that will have social value out of these buildings, but are we keeping up with this? It seems that architects are running with retrofit. Is the heritage sector close behind it? I'm not so sure. Um, so this isn't all negativity. I've got, you know, some examples of where the focus is probably sometimes on the wrong thing. Um, as I mentioned, you know, focusing on paint swatches um, for a building that is run for a not-for-profit, very benign colours, you know, it stopped them opening, it stopped them, uh, their staff were people with um, learning disabilities, you know, it's a really good project that was stopped because of an unreasonable, um, you know, unreasonable oversight essentially. Um, you know, blanket bans on spotlights in all historic buildings, it, it's, you know, it's things like that, that's the stories I'm hearing, that's what I'm experiencing, um, and you don't get to hear about the good things um, that people are trying to do. So, um, you know, I think, I, going back to the ethical obligation, I, you know, for me, it's about helping people uh, get the best out of buildings, um, you know, getting that balance right, and um, helping people get a viable end use for it, because it's not just about putting a roof on a building anymore, we have to think about what it's going to be used for. You can have a perfectly sound building, water, you know, watertight, you know, roof good, if it hasn't got a use, it's at risk. Um, so we, we need to think a bit more commercially, I think, um, you know, and, and it's not in the best interest. Um, I have an example where we've got a grade one listed building, was in use as a, a school, someone has acquired it, wants to restore it sensitively back to a, a home. Um, the slate they are in, on the roof um, can't be acquired for the next three years because there's someone else with an option on it. There's water coming in, ruining interiors, but the conservation officer simply won't budge and contemplate a material that is exactly the same, but isn't the same. So, you know, it, it's an, there's interesting questions here, and, you know, it's all about that sort of conservation question, which I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not going to go into here. So, um, you know, lots of horror stories, but there's also really good stories as well, you know, and so to the opportunity. Um, you know, this is it. it it's sometimes the opportunity is a combination of favourable circumstances or situations plural, to lots of people, I think that's the thing. Um, you know, there is that multitude of benefits, you know, 
investors, whether we like them or not, and developers, but also the community. So if change is approached in a sustainable and sensitive way, and you know, proposals are met with pragmatism, sometimes commerciality, um, you know, it's, the funding pot is diminishing. People will want to invest in these things. They do need a return. Um, and that can be more than financial. And this is a focus that um, I'm, I'm sort of moving on to at the moment in my work. And it's more about social impact as well. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an opportunity to make a difference to communities with buildings and, and through community use or just improving their, their general environment. So, um, I said retrofit is the opportunity that we've got here. And, you know, back to the session summary where it says, you know, real examples where, you know, something has happened because there's no other option available. And I think we're facing that on quite a lot of our historic built environment. We have to reconsider other uses because, you know, its traditional use is not, um, you know, it, it, it can't be, it's not viable anymore. So, um, you know, I think I tell people as a buildings archaeologist, be interrogative, you know, don't take things on face value. You'll be surprised, actually interrogate. You might find opportunity where you never thought um, you would find it before. And, and I think that's exactly what I say to decision makers when they approach proposals for change for the historic built environment. Don't take it on face value because you might be pleasantly surprised. Um, and so just to sort of move on to some of the positives and talk about social impact here. So um, I'm a trustee of a charity that was set up in 1976 called the Architectural Heritage Fund. Um, they received substantial funding um, from um, Historic England, CADU, uh, Historic Environment Scotland. Um, they are a charity as well and you can support them. What um, they do, they help communities, not-for-profits um, and other groups find sustainable, viable use for historic buildings. Um, again, it goes beyond putting a nice roof on it. it, goes, it they, they grant funds, they lend to organisations who want to make a real impact. Um, I was involved with, we've set up the first um, heritage-focused social impact fund called the Heritage Impact Fund. Um, I have that, set that up with them. And that's a lending fund. Um, again, there has to be a financially viable use for the building at the end. It's been enormously successful and supported by National Lottery as well as HE and HES. Um, so some of the projects, this is just some examples of what you can do by I think, thinking differently about end uses. This is a former hotel um, and is now going to be affordable green homes in the heart of the town centre. So in this particular area, young families, people who have lived there, born there, um, were moving out because they just could not contemplate taking on older buildings that were energy inefficient. So this is a, a, a project where they're actually greening this building and it, um, the end users will be local people who you know, desperately need housing. Um, this one, Poprex, this has been in, th in the Guardian, fantastic. So we have real issues with our department stores shutting down all over the country. This is a reuse um, of a department store in Sunderland where we've got a training kitchen for young people. Um, Poprex, uh, community space, it, it, it's a great, great example of reuse, thinking differently about these buildings. Um, and this is the, the Guardian article about it. So, Using buildings like this, thinking differently about them and the end use, not doing blanket bounds on spotlights and various other things, you know, sweating the small detail, thinking about the bigger picture, can have real impact on communities. Um, this is one I particularly like. Uh, this is about it's restoring shop units, but it's accommodation for those at risk of homelessness as well. So, you know, we're getting economic and social impact out to that building because um, we've got commercial on the ground floor. And just to finish up, this is Riverside House in Stourbridge, a project that I'm working on at the moment. Um, it's, a, it, it's a former industrial site, ironworks. Uh, at the bottom is the Grade 2 listed Iron Masters House. That's going to be dealt with last. This is a wellbeing centre, but focused on isolated individuals in the community and also um, people with learning difficulties. And just, you know, anyone can go there. It's fantastic. It's, it's amazing to see something so positive um, come out of some, a site that had such a sort of, you know, real hard industrial heritage um, and they're doing fantastic things um, and want to do, we've got some roundhouses uh, being built as well there. Um, so just to sort of conclude, um, I think, you know, Kate Clark said in the keynote the other day that um, we need to adopt an open approach. 
um, we have to look at social value. These are examples of adopting that open approach. We get social value out of these projects. Um, there may be proposals that actually don't compromise significance of buildings. It, it's interrogating them, thinking about them in a different way rather than just saying, we've always done it that way. No, we don't allow it. So this is, you know, it, there's, there's really good value economically and socially out of thinking differently. And I think we have a responsibility um, to further our knowledge, to better inform understanding of our heritage. Um, you know, and, and I think... Um, you know, the impetus is, this is the right time for us. There's a focus on high street, there's a focus on regeneration and retrofit. And we have a real opportunity to impact communities by doing, the, by thinking differently. Um, and, and just, you know, and seeing the opportunity and trying to mitigate those challenge and the fights. And hopefully, I'm looking forward to the day I can go into, you know, a real estate event and people are really excited about their projects rather than telling me their horror stories. So. Thank you.